Hi, this is Jerry Conway, and you're listening to Amazing Spider Talk. Two men who know the angles, uncover and untangle all the questions and the webs left out to tangle. I'll be in 1962, last Wednesday's afternoon. They'll bend your ears with reckless self abandon. The Amazing Spider-Talk The Amazing Spider-Talk Come swing through the air Sit back and prepare For the Amazing Hello and welcome to The Amazing Spider Talk. My name is Dan Gavazdan and I'm the founder and editor of SuperiorSpiderTalk.com. And I'm Mark Chinacchio, founder of the Chasing Amazing blog and an editor at Superior Spider Talk. Well, thanks everybody for joining us for our coverage of Amazing Spider-Man, Dead No More, The Clone Conspiracy, Omega. We hope you enjoy this podcast and that it provides an intelligent conversation between two fans and collectors as we look at the Spider-Man comic universe in a bit of a bigger picture. Woo! Yes, Dan, and for this episode, we will be discussing Amazing Spider-Man, Dead No More, The Clone Conspiracy, Omega, Bye. hold on, another breath, <gasps> Dan Slott, Christo Gage, Corey T. Smith, Peter David, Mark Bagley and Stuart, name I still can never say right, Eminem, 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 Eminem's, the really good artist whose first name is Stuart. All right. From 8 Mile, apparently. <laughs> you just, yeah, exactly. Uh, his name is Stan. No, uh, well, then we'll be announcing a new giveaway. We will be reading your reviews, answering your emails, and then we're going to get to some spider news that's been building up over um, our really awesome recording schedule the last few weeks, Dan. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be exciting. It's going to be great. It's going to be Omega sized, Omega red sized. Yeah, right. Well, or or the ten dollar issue size. They, we get these two expensive issues back to back. Yeah, man. Like, empty out your wallets. It's Spider Man time. Okay. <laughs> there was no Alpha. There can only be Omega. So let's talk about this review. What's new? Man, that transition was smooth as silk, let me tell you. It's just just super smooth. Well, let me let me let me open up uh the, the conversation here a bit, Dan. I mean, okay, so this is the Omega. This is the official, official last chapter so uh, of the clone conspiracy. So we kind of tie tidy up some loose ends in the first story here about Peter and Parker Industries and what's going on with the rhino what's going on with lizard what's going on with jonah what's going you know like like let's just like run the gamut of all the loose ends of this storyline um you know for the most part we were pretty okay-ish with clone conspiracy i don't think we we loved it but we didn't dislike it um and with that said i i was pretty disappointed with this issue because i felt like uh, Omega here was a really decent, provocative ending to a story that didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, that's what's so hard to rate this issue or talk about this issue. I liked your uh, shrug emoticon on the site. Yes. Um, because – and it, I mean this is the most interesting thing to talk about this issue is that like you're yeah, right. It feels like an ending to a far better story and I don't want to knock this issue because like on its own, if it had a great story to back it up, this would be a really interesting issue and it kind of – in being as decent or better than decent that it is – it's like basically a litmus test showcasing all the things that went wrong with the clone conspiracy. 
Yeah, I mean, it kind of just like serves to remind you of all of the character beats that were never fully developed or all of its own inconsistencies. I mean, you know, a lot of that can be found just in kind of like Peter's banter with other characters in this in this story here. I mean, like, you know, let's let's start with um, Kane and Spider Gwen. I mean, you know, he's kind of very dismissive to with Kane when when you know when in terms of of the whereabouts of Ben Riley like oh you know his he it's his 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 suits right here of course he's dead which just just seems kind of odd that you know Peter of all people would um be so dismissive and then he seems very kind of um I don't know what the word is uh uh distant with with spider Gwen and and kind of remorseful that you know and not thinking of her as the real Gwen which it's kind of antagonistic would, yeah and and you would kind of be like all right i guess that would make sense if we had any reason to believe in the one comic of this storyline where peter and gwen had an extended conversation that peter thought of her as the real gwen but as we even talked about last episode that was not the story that that comic put forward. He he thought of her as a clone, and you know we've been here before, haha. Ha. So it's just like a lot of dissidents there, and I, I, I like, what am I supposed to take away from those interactions? I'm. Mean, what did you take away from those interactions? I mean, it made me think that you know, and this is true about the whole issue, is that I feel like Gage was given like a plot summary outline uh, of the whole clone conspiracy. And in issue five of the clone conspiracy, it was up to Dan Slott to bridge the gap, to, to make Peter change his mind about Gwen. And I think we kind of get some inkling of that in that issue, you know, with Gwen's death, their quote unquote death rather. Um, right. But it doesn't, it doesn't, complete or doesn't circle the square or whatever you, you want to say. And so Gwen, you know, Gage ends up looking like he's just contradicting himself, um, which is totally baffling. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's just kind of, you know, trying to figure out who, you know, who's leading what elements of the story forward here is, is, is really kind of mind bending here. And, and I just like, I, I, I feel like, and maybe this is me kind of going too hard and strong into the cynicism dance. So I apologize, but like just in general, the, like a lot of this comic, especially in these opening parts here is kind of like my least favorite version of Peter Parker that we've been getting the last few years, kind of like this, like insufferably guilty, you know, paralyzed by guilt version of this character where you're just kind of like saying to yourself, do you even know you're a superhero? You know what I mean? Like there's like just like no joy to this character whatsoever. I mean, you know, all the characters had just got through this very dire apocalyptic situation. And not that I would expect um, Peter to be popping champagne in this issue. I mean, there's still a lot of fallout and consequences and ramifications. But like, I mean, you know, just the... The 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 sad sapness was just so thick in this in this comic. I mean, between, you know, going back to the characters that were kind of well, it's funny. I feel like we did like a double walk back here in this with these characters that we thought were dead and were cloned. uh, And then at the end of Clone Conspiracy 5 turned out to be alive. And now we're finding out. Well, they're probably going to be dead again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bad, bad news. You were dead, but now you're going to die again. Yeah. Now, now your death's going to be more painful. Like, uh, what's his name? The 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 Parker Industries of Jerry play. Salteres. Yeah, Jerry Salteres. Who you know, like you would think that Jerry Salteres um, was another Uncle Ben moment for Peter in this issue. Uh, based on his reaction to having to, you know, break the news to his his um, his soon to be widow. I mean, I, to be honest, I liked that scene. I think it the way that Gage, or I'm assuming Gage, wrote the dialogue. Um, I like how he plays with Peter dropping the veil of being Spider-Man, um, like uh, to the widow inadvertently and and kind of how difficult it is now that 
Peter is such a public figure, it's hard for him to kind of uh, lock these kind of losses as Spider-Man off with that persona and how it kind of bleeds. You know, it's not Spider-Man's fault that this guy died. It's Peter's fault, which is a unique wrinkle, I thought, and was interestingly played with. Yeah, I get what you're saying, Dan, and I don't disagree with you per se. It is a pretty cool scene, but like every like what we're going to say a lot in this episode, I just don't feel like it was a good scene that paid off something that really didn't happen in this earlier story. Like I, I, I didn't get a sense that there was really this emotional journey between Peter and his employee, Jerry. I mean, Jerry was kind of, you know, introduced way, way back at the preludes stages of this storyline and then really wasn't talked about much except for a little reference here and there until now. So, you know, to kind of have this like big emotional climax, like, you know, this is what got Peter into this mess. You know, I guess it's a bookend, but, um, so much other stuff happens that kind of distracts, at least me as the reader from it. Like, I don't know. I, I it, it didn't, it didn't ring true to me that he would be this, broken up and distraught over what happened here. Yeah, I I agree with you on that and I I, I think it is uh, it's interesting because it shows how Peter has quote unquote changed from this story that, you know, before he was rushing to kind of save this guy and now he's just kind of um accepting his fate, but then I started asking myself questions about Ben Riley, if he could never cure these people to begin with and was just kind of putting them aside, allowing them to die and replacing them with clones, I mean, I guess that's somewhat consistent with his ideologies that he wanted to basically just allow people to die and clone them. But, like, it's a weird wrinkle that kind of cast this guy as pure villain rather than complicated, you know, guy who thinks he's being heroic. I mean, that, that to me is like nothing but villainous. Yeah. Again, it's just, it's just a lot of dissidents. I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is what happens when you have two people kind of co-writing a story, but I, I mean, you know, I feel like there were chapters of the original clone saga with four different writers that there was a little bit more of a through line to than some of this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, well, maybe that's, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe I'm just, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, this one didn't get you to quit comics. (laughs) No, it didn't. It didn't, you know, um, I mean, you're, you're right. And you wonder like with all this back and forth and we were constantly not complaining, but being critical of maybe we were complaining, but uh, we were being critical of this book for retreading so much ground. If it was just arranged differently, could we have spent more time with the same number of issues establishing Jerry and his widow and the emotional connection to that? And and let's get to the big one here because um, it's on the cover is the rhino. You know, we are meant to feel an emotional catharsis, which I think it's beautifully handled in this issue. It's a really kind of interesting way to to finish that story. If it wasn't purely built on the back of our emotional connection to that awesome Rhino story from the gauntlet over a hundred issues ago. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is right there. My biggest issue with this whole Rhino subplot is that, you know, it, it not only does it not pay off the rhino's arc from this story, but it, it, you know it pays off something from the rhino that you know conceivably a lot of people reading these issues right now haven't even read. So it's like, you know, yeah, I know it's only what ten years old, give or take, maybe maybe like seven or eight years old since that rhino story was published. But you know, with the way comic readers are now i mean you know there are the 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 long-term stalwarts like you and me dan and then there are like a lot of like kind of new fans who hop on a book hop off and certainly in the dan slot era i think people probably hopped on for superior then maybe hopped off then came back for spider-verse and hopped off and came on for this 
Um, so people conceivably could have never have opened those two issues off up. And like, yeah, for us, we 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 talked about those issues on the show. We love them. We think they're it's a really great one of the highlights of the brand new day era. But you know, we're 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 not. The, I don't feel we're the, the target audience of these comics anymore, Dan. So like, who, what what are we? What is trying to be paid off here? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that you say that because. Uh, you know, we take it for granted almost that people know that this, you know, this stuff because, you know, and of course Dan Slott knows this stuff like the back of his hand. He loves continuity stuff. I, and it made me think you just saying this right now about our amazing Spider Talk Facebook discussion group um, where I kind of put up a snarky comment about Dan Slott's comics and stuff like that, which I probably was a bit too harsh, but – one of the responses was one of our listeners saying that he is always challenged by Dan Slott's comics and the continuity within them. But like, what is, what is the point of that challenge here? You know, like it's just almost like a trivia, but, but a trivia question that you're hinging an entire emotional beat on. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it, 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 I I just don't know if you, get anything out of the entire interaction between these two characters in this comic without having read that other story. And you cannot assume in your own, when you're writing your own story that someone has read another story from not just a couple of months ago, but years ago, you know, like it's, it's, you know, in the same vein, like throughout this storyline, we kind of reference things like death of Gwen Stacy and, and which are iconic storylines, death of Gene DeWolf. I mean, like, okay, you can, you can lean on those a little bit, but like this rhino story, it's not like an, we love it, but it's not an all timer, you know? (laughs) So it's like, you know, what, what what were they really expecting in in kind of po- playing off that story so so heavily here? Yeah, uh, it's not like um, Oksana is one of the floating heads in the sky of guilt. You know, you know, we don't we're not reminded of her every twenty issues and her existence and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I bet people don't even remember that the Rhino was supposed to be dead. You know, and and, and that's far more recent. Did we ever yeah. get a satisfying reason for why he wasn't dead? Yeah, that that confused me. Was he is he a clone? No, right? It's, no, I don't I think don't so. I mean, the man in red, aka Ben Riley slash at the time, I don't know if they knew it was Ben Riley uh, approaching him. He somehow survived, which I'm guessing means we're gonna. I know we're getting a civil stable story, so maybe we'll find out the details during that. Um, it's just a lot to layer on one character. It's the long game, Dan. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, you know, kind of going back to like the, the the punching the checklist here. You know, we got like some obligatory stuff with Jonah. We got some stuff with um, um, <laughs> uh, the Silk and 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 you know Prowler and like oh yeah these characters still exist. Hey, somebody who is kind of absent from the story, which surprised me, is Aunt May. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we haven't we haven't checked in on May since that really that really well done like clock story. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, and what did you think about the like Uncle Ben in a the tomb thing? I mean, I I thought it was okay, but you know, again. I mean, that's kind of a. I almost see Uncle Ben stuff in the context of the story as a bit of a crutch. You know, it's like when in doubt, we can we can play up some emotion with a Peter Uncle Ben exchange, like the yeah. way it's done here. Um, like there there was nothing about it that was revelatory. Just like you know, a lot of people were kind of talking up, not to go backwards, but the P- Peter's or Spider Man's pep talk to the Rhino about kind of moving past the pain and. You know, yeah, it was it was a well crafted moment and the dialogue sounded sincere and wasn't corny or anything like that. But at the same token, like these aren't new ideas for me. This doesn't give me new insights to the character or give me a new 
kind of, oh, wow, you know, I never thought about it that way. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's like the whole thing. It's a very well-crafted conclusion to a story we didn't get. Right. Um, like, and it's, it's challenging in that because, like, I mean, especially in the format that we review these things issue by issue because you want to look at this and say, well, this is an interesting issue except that it's supported by literally nothing. Um, and that's really – that's challenging. And I think that's been true of almost all of this – story is you presented something i guess fairly compelling in the amazing spider-man issues but nothing is done with it or it's completely ignored like the gwen and the ben stuff in the regular clone conspiracy book right hey so on the good news you totally called what happened to the lizard yeah i totally did call it but i don't want to pat myself on the back too much i think it was a pretty safe uh, thing to call, but it, it but it does also bring up a bunch of other questions that I have about the lizard, uh, because he seems kind of villainous. But I thought the whole point was that he's now like a rational human being stuck in a lizard body, um, made of brainy material. I don't know if that design has been totally forgotten about. Yeah, you know, we'll 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 get to it someday. We're playing the long game, Dan. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, I like this twist. He did, in after all, save his family, even if they are somewhat lizard-like. But that's the essence of a character, right? He he made a sacrifice, you know, in order to heal his arm back. And this is, like, I guess the next logical extension of that. Absolutely. Everyone's a lizard. <laughs> It's yeah. what he wanted all along, right? The world to be yeah. ruled by lizards. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, what did you think? I was gonna say, what did you think about Corey T. Smith uh, in, ter- in terms of the artwork for this first story? I liked, I liked his work a lot. It kind of was reminiscent to me of um, Giuseppe Comancoli's Spider Verse um, artwork, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I thought it was really um, emotional, like. Beautiful artwork. I think his Spider-Man moves like Mark Bagley's uh, Spider-Man does in the air. There's that great like moment where he's kicking the rhino in the face. And I thought his maskless Uncle Ben scene, you know, it kind of looked like the MCU Spider-Man for a brief moment there. Did you get that? No, I I, I I don't know if I saw that. I mean, I, I, I overall liked the work, but at the same token, I didn't feel he had a ton to work with. I mean, yeah, the Uncle Ben scene was well done, and I do felt feel like the Rhino fight, as truncated as it was, was well done. But then, you know, a lot of this was also just kind of people in dark rooms talking to each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it is good for what it is. I would love to see this guy come back. You know, if if, if this is going to be Common Coley's, like, amongst his final issues. I mean, who knows? He comes on and off so frequently, but, like, I'd love to get some of these guys were really digging to hang around a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, I, I mean, I, I think I was more into him than you were, but I really like travel foreman a lot from the civil war two series. Um, so yeah, it'd be good to kind of get some more people on here. And I know you like, uh, who was the artist from the cloak and dagger arc? Uh, I think it was Buffagni. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it'd be good to kind of mix that up. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the Scarlet Spider backup? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think this was an interesting, uh, like a next step to the story we got in the amazing Spider-Man issue. And, and again, I think it, it holds the same criticism that I have for the previous issue. We, I mean, the previous story we just discussed is that it feels like a conclusion to a very different character. Yeah, I mean, I would even say that this is kind of like the third version of the character we're getting here. Yeah. And it's still not <laughs> and it's and it's still not 90s Ben Riley, but you know, we're we're, we're going to get to a phone call in a little bit that might explain why that is. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, but, um yeah, it, it's. I didn't mind it, and it had some like quirky Peter Davidisms in it, and I thought Mark 
I, I don't know. I really dug Bagley's artwork on this. It just felt, it felt like ultimate Spider-Man, but in the mainstream universe now, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, like I thought facially, it was like very strong. Like I, I really, I mean, I just love like Bagley could just even draw people talking so well during ultimate. And I just felt, cause this was very talky for a backup. It just felt really, I don't know. I liked I it a lot it. more than I liked Bagley's recent work on X-Men. Yeah. Um, yeah, agreed. And I liked that he kept that weird kind of degenerating clone thing that he did in the Ultimate Clone Saga. Yes. Um, for the face of Ben. That's really creepy, the kind of like peeling off skin thing. Yeah, no. I mean, like, the thing is, like, I, I still, I just don't know what to make about this series, what it's going to be. I mean, like, you know, it, it definitely feels like a knockoff of what we got from Kane and Scarlet Spider a few years ago. I mean, it's like, uh, it's the clone on the lamb again, kind of, you know, on the road again. And it's like, I don't know. Do, do, do you, do you see anything kind of deeper than that going on here? I mean, no, but I mean, I think the distinction that, I'm sensing from the Kane character is not even a positive one. It's like, I think this character seems totally repugnant and not about someone I would want to read. You know, like he doesn't seem like an anti-hero that I'm excited to read about. He just straight up like murders a couple guys and then kisses Rita kind of aggressively and out of nowhere it's not it's not even like a hero or anti-hero that I'm excited to read about. Uh, he talks about like murdering people because God is cruel. Like, I don't know. It just seems like such an ugly character physically and uh, personality wise. It's it's the kind of thing I don't really know that I want to read about month to month. Yeah, I mean, I have a feeling this will probably do okay as an issue number one, but I have a feeling that this book is going to lose a lot of traction very fast because I think people are going to pick this book up. You know, and this, the, there's going to be the nostalgia hit for it, and then people very fast are going to realize this is not who they think they're reading about. And, you know, like you said, there's not much to glom onto because it's not, he's not like a charismatic anti hero, like. Um, you know, like a Venom or, you know, or even Kane or, or even Kane and, you know, okay. You know, you, they got how many 15 issues out of a carnage solo series, but carnage is so over the top and fantastical as a villain that like, that's the allure there. I don't think the character is over the top enough, nor do I think it would be appropriate if they went in that direction. Yeah. I have so no like, idea what this book is going to be. So, so who is this book being, you know, who, who's, who's, what kind of person is going to get into this book? You know what I mean? Who is this book for? <laughs> I have no idea. What, like, by the way, like, what like, was, what was up with Rita commenting on him wearing a hoodie? Uh, I mean, is that just a gag to go back to the, you know, the Scarlet Spider hoodie? But she, but she expresses it like, oh, yeah, you and the hoodies, you're always wearing a hoodie. And it's like, wait a minute. Does she know that he, like, wore a hoodie and swung around the town as Spider-Man? Like, you know, wait, I think they're just, I think they're just trying to wink at, at that. But, I mean, you know, not that she knows, but they're like, oh, of course this guy wears hoodies all the time, even though in – nothing in clone conspiracy indicates that he ever wore a hoodie, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> you with headgear, you're always wearing headgear. You with those two eyes and ears, you always had two eyes and ears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So we're kind of mixed on this one. We like the artwork and we're not really sure what the hell is going to go on with this character. What about, yeah. um, the other tease, the King's favor tease? Yeah. I mean, like, I'm, I, I love the artwork and, you know, I, I actually really like the little teasers and tidbits of the Kingpin that we've been getting throughout this entire um, arc. So that was 
okay. I actually, I, you know, in a lot of ways, I really like how Slot writes Kingpin. Um, I think he actually kind of gets the, 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 the manipulative menace of the character. Um, but here's my thing. And, and, you know, like this, so this is obviously setting up the, 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 what's it called? The Osborne legacy. Um, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Whatever the, the arc, the next arc is going to be called. And like, I would buy like sp- the twist of the story, you know, Spider-Man basically selling out to Kingpin to get Osborne's locations. If for the last three years of continuity, we had any sense that Peter was like obsessing over Osborne because he hasn't been like, you know, he, he showed up at the end of superior made his jokes about the his man person all that and and you know mason banks yada yada and then we ha- you know like outside of osborne showing up in teases but it's not like in the co- in the in the context of the narrative of the comic has peter ever been like bemoaning the fact that osborne slipped from his grasp again right am i missing something did i am i forgetting a story no you're 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 dead on there i mean i'm willing to kind of like look the other way because I love this artwork and I, w- I wonder how much my feeling about the next arc is going to be influenced by Eminem and my absolute adoration for his artwork but uh, yeah you're absolutely right uh, ab- about that and uh, how much more excited I would be for this other than saying well here's our next uh, obligatory goblin story uh, you know if, if they had like been seeding that the goblin was out there and Peter wanted to find him, which is, I think, the perfect story for this new goblin because we don't know what he's going to look like. We don't really know what would identify him because he's sane now. It's the perfect kind of setup for Peter searching for the, uh, you know, Osborne because we literally don't know where to find him. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know... Looking at the solicitations, it it certainly appears that um, from the solicitations that Spider-Man is going to be pushing the boundaries of what he normally does to go after an adversary here. And, uh, you know, yes, again, it's Osborne. It's the Goblin. There's history there. But we th- th- this has not been seeded in the least over the last few years of this comic. So it's like, you know, you're 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 you're. you're making people kind of lean on previously established content that you yourself didn't even write to motivate them to want to dive into this story. And I think that's just dangerous terrain. Mark, I got one response to that. Yeah, Yeah. but the art. Yeah, but the art. All right. (laughs) Um, Do we want to, do we want to grade this whole issue? Yeah, I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but uh, yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, you know, you, 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 I think you have more positive than, than me, so we're, we're, I'm going I'm to let you go first. I'm not going to let you let my grade influence you. I think it's going to be a, a, a C plus for me. This is it's hard. I, I want to <laughs> go higher, but I, I, I just can't. Um, and since I can't give a shrug emoji uh, over the uh, podcast, I'm going to go D plus. All right, so there you go. Yeah. Um, another baffling issue of this book. Yay! Yay! New let's arc. let's move on to something a little more entertaining, and that's our awesome comments and emails and voicemails. Spider. Yes, Dan, of course, we here at Amazing Spider Talk love to hear from you, our, our, our great listeners. Uh, so the way, how do you do that? How do you get in touch with us? How do you get your stuff read right on the air? Well, of course, you can leave us a rating and a comment on iTunes, on Stitcher, on YouTube. Uh, this what helps us grow our community. You could also email us at AmazingSpiderTalk at gmail.com. You could tweet at us and hashtag it OK to print. Or you can call Nine Red Goblin uh, to leave a voicemail. Uh, Dan, it looks like this week we got a, both a, a rating through iTunes and a voicemail. I'm going to read this rating here because uh, I love reading ratings. 
Uh, it's from TSW71, highly entertaining, five out of five stars. Recently discovered Amazing Spider Talk podcast when they talk with Ryan Stegman, and I've been binging since. The guys are funny, and I find their reviews informative and fair. Love the show. Dan, it's like the second time we've been said we've been funny. Yeah, Mark, it's great to be told I'm funny, but I'm trying not to let it affect me and let it get to my head. Normally, when I make a joke, people like, turn away and, and try to ignore me, but to actually find out that someone considers me funny, it could be dangerous. I'm, I, I could let it get to my head, and maybe perhaps it already has. Well, we better not let Swarm hear this comment, because he might take credit for it, because he, <laughs> he, he probably thinks he's the funny one. And he is a little humorous, uh, like gallows humor, if you will. Oh, be serious, Dan. All right, all right. Uh, you want to listen to this amazingly detailed uh, voicemail that we received? Yeah, it's from our good friend Elliot. Uh, Elliot, it's always good to hear from you, so uh, take it away, voicemail. Hey, guys, it's Elliot. Sorry it's been a while. I've just had a lot of trouble sorting out this clone conspiracy stuff. Ben Riley is uh, my favorite comic book character and a huge reason I got into Spider-Man comics is the Clone Saga. So seeing this character assassination has been super tough, though I feel like I'm a bit hypocritical getting upset about it because I can remember a time when uh, 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 doing something very similar in the Clone Saga, joining up with the Jackal, and that seemed to piss off a lot of fans. And I've spent a lot of years trying to defend that storyline uh, uh, when Peter joined up with the Jackal, and it just seems like such a similar beat even though it's completely different and completely bigger in, in clone uh, conspiracy, it's very similar. Uh, on a separate note, uh, I, I have a kind of reason why Ben might be crazier than, than normal. Uh, during sibling rivalry, I believe it was, during the Superior Art era, uh, Chris Yost wrote a story in, um, I think it was Avenging Spider-Man, or no, Superior Spider-Man Team-Up. And at the end of it, it was a story with the Jackal, and at the end of it, the Jackal said, oh, I'm going to create Spider-Side 2. And I think that was just a story that nobody ever wanted to touch again, and it was just a plot thread that was completely dropped off the face of the earth that only Chris Yost cared about. But it's possible that Spider-Side 2 is this new version of Ben who thinks he's Ben. And if you think about it, there it, it's similar to when the – third clone of Peter Parker thought he was the genuine Peter Parker until he turned into Freak Face in the 90s, and I believe Freak Face turned into Spider-Side, so maybe it's that, or maybe it can be retcon to be that. Anyway, I'm done rambling. I'm very upset about this, but let's see if Scarlet Spider's any good. Keep up the great show. Love you guys. Thanks for the mug. Mark, how do you respond to a voicemail like that? Elliot, you know a lot about the Clone Saga, um, and as you were saying all those things, I was like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah," but never in a million. And I've I've read read and reread this this storyline many times, and I I just your attention to detail is without peer. Um, and you know, I know something. I think. Saying that Ben Riley is Spider Side, I mean, like it's not even a no prize. It's just like you you just put more thought into it than I think others at Marvel are. So you win. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think in a million years that it is Spider Side, mainly because I don't think anybody would get that. Although we just got done discussing how Dan Slott pulled out an obscure Rhino story and hung an entire emotional arc on that. Um, and pulling out that superior team up story that teased Spider Side 2 might not be that far of a reach, especially considering that Ben Riley is wearing the Spider Side costume in the new series. Anything can happen, Dan. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen because it's such a hated character, but yeah, I mean, anything can happen for sure. Elliot, you. you I don't even know. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm without words. <laughs> all right. Well, well. Speaking of words, why don't we get to all of the words of our friendly neighborhood Spider Talk Members Club? It's the friendly neighborhood Spider Talk Members Club. It's the club with the incredibly long-winded name. Yeah, the friendly neighborhood Spider Talk Members Club. Time for new members to give fifteen minutes of fame. And maybe. 
Mark, it's the friendly neighborhood spider talk members club part of the show, and that means we're giving away stuff to all of our awesome members. Remember, if you want to become a member, you can go to our front page, click on the big button that says Support Superior Spider Talk, and it'll take you right over to our Patreon page where you can sign up to be a part of our club. If you join up with our club, that means you get entered into our awesome raffle that we do every two weeks. And this time we've got, well... I don't really know how to describe it. I'm going to call it a Spider-Man mystery gift box. It's kind of like a loot crate thing, except it's not loot crate. I put it together, and it's a bunch of awesome Spider-Man goodies that I'm going to just mail off to someone who's a member of our club. Uh, Mark, what do you think is in the box? I bet you it's a bunch of stuff that you're re-gifting. Cool, because that's still a great prize for someone. (laughs) <laughs> Dan Gavazin regifts. You know, I, it's, like it's, I, I'll tell you, it's my... not regifts. Okay, it's but, Spider-Man socks. But I do have a problem with that. Uh, my family has decided that the only thing they know about me is that I like Star Wars and Spider-Man. So every Christmas, I get a bunch of like five dollar Spider-Man and Star Wars items that there's no way in hell I'm ever going to use. Uh, and I just don't know what to do with them. Uh, so yeah, maybe down the line, I'm going to pass those on to people, but I feel kind of bad sending people like Spider-Man drink cozies. If you want Spider-Man drink cozies, let me know because I will just send them to you either way. (laughs) You know what sounds like a great thing for your family to get you for Christmas this year, Dan? What? A copy of A Hundred Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die, uh, oh. which is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm which hoping is, I like, get that as a wedding gift. Because, like, because the fact of the matter is, Dan, like, that that story of, like, oh, let's get this, let's get our son some Chotsky thing of from this, this uh, pop culture thing he likes. That is, like, my target audience for this book. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, true. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to rely very heavily on, hey, doesn't so-and-so like Spider-Man? I bet you he doesn't know a hundred things about him. And then so-and-so is going to open up this book and be like, man, I really knew nothing about Spider-Man. This is way nerdier than I thought. <laughs> I was going to say they're going to open it up and be like, Duh, of course I know about Craven's Last Hunt. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> this book sucks. That might be how I respond to it. Really? I've been I've been this excited about this? Yeah. Oh god, it's another thousand words about the hobgoblin. <laughs> <laughs> I already read that on his website. <laughs> Quiet. It's all new original content, Dan. <laughs> it is. It is, isn't it? Most of it. Yeah. Yes, most of them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the Spider-Man mystery gift box. I don't know if you're excited about this, but you should be. Come on over to our page. Help support us. It's how we keep the show going. And I mean that. Like, uh, this thing, this money chest or whatever gets emptied out every month by giving out prizes and paying for things that need to keep the show going. Uh, Mark... Uh, you know about our, some of our new sound issues. Well, money is going to fix that. So there you go. Anyway, this is a lot of sausage making. Help the show stay afloat and get awesome prizes in the mail. Mark, let's talk about some spider news. Give me pictures of the spider man. I need something that's from K2. I want to see him slinging those webs around. I want to make him look like a fool. We need to get this vigilante. Let's up the Absolutely, Dan. I mean, we had a bunch of announcements. I mean, it, it appears that um, Marvel is kind of re not rebooting itself again, but kind of getting set for a wave of some new titles and relaunches and stuff like that over the coming months. Um, and, and Spider-Man is kind of not immune to that. I, I think the, the biggest news in terms of new content is the new Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man series. I guess this is going to be volume two or is that volume three? Of I think it's volume but, three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be written by uh, Chip Zdar- uh, God, I'm bad with names today. Chip Zdarsky. Zdarsky. Uh, with art, 
Zadarsky. Sorry, from um, from Howard the Duck fame, and um, he's the artist of Sex Criminals. Uh, he likes to harass Applebee's on Facebook. He's also the sole proprietor of Zadarsky.com. <laughs> which is super, are you are you familiar with Zadarsky.com, Dan? I'm not. I'm not. Oh my God! So. A couple of years ago, wherever Chip is out in the Midwest, he decided to just set up a card table on the side of the road and do Sadarsky com. <laughs> like Did anybody like, come? Are there photos of people attending? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. People will go, <laughs> and like, and he like he does this once a year. He announces, "I'm going to be somewhere for Sadarsky com," and he just sets it up on the side of the road. It's like him, and he does sketches, and he signs autographs, and you know. That's amazing. Own, I kind of want to go now. Yeah, I mean, this guy is a total character, um, and I think um, will be a really interesting choice. I mean, like, you know, I, I almost, I almost wonder is he going to make Spider Man too silly? But yeah, did you read his Howard the Duck? I did, and I enjoyed it. I mean, but like, it's like Howard the Duck can be insane. So we'll see uh, if that kind of tone, I don't think he's going to use the same tone for Spider-Man, but I mean, if he did, I don't know how that would work. Yeah. I mean, his Aunt May in that series, like, was a gun toting, like, vigilante of some sort. Uh, So, I mean, what? (laughs) But um, what did you think about some of the details that we got about this new series. I mean, they specifically seem to be stressing the New York City setting, the grounded stories. And then Zdarsky even said, like, Amazing Spider-Man number 33, like, our favorite, is the influence for this series. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, the first thing I also noticed was the cover art is it's the old costume. Um which is funny because they said in the like press briefing that he would still be running Parker Industries, and I wonder if that's just a way to kind of like not reveal the conclusion to this upcoming story, which I imagine will be bringing down that company. Right, right. Um, but uh, and then there's also what this female comedian character that's going to be friends with Peter in this series. So that might be where he, you know, brings in the heavy comedy. Uh, into this book. I don't know. I'm tremendously excited about it. Um, but it, uh, let's talk about like the implications of this. Like this is the first like true, I guess like Spider-Man alternate series we've gotten since brand new day started. What do you think this signals for the series? Um, I don't know if, it, if, how d- deep the implications are. I mean, I do wonder, you know, we've been kind of speculating for a while now if Dan Slott is a little overworked and maxed out on this character and maybe, you know, between this and Renew Your Vows and and then Amazing, because, um, you know, they did confirm that Amazing will continue. I wonder if they're going to start moving Amazing to a monthly book instead of um, bi uh, weekly. Um, that would be, that would be my, I think my biggest expectation in terms of change for the spider verse here. Yeah, Mark, I, I I don't know. I think, I think you might be right. Uh, I certainly think that could be a positive for amazing Spider-Man. Um, I mean, I, I think we've said it before, but the minute that Dan Slott picked up Silver Surfer, I think was right alongside the time that the quality, I think you and I felt in amazing Spider-Man definitely dipped. I wonder if giving him a more relaxing schedule will allow him to really flesh out these interesting ideas he has with with character moments, etc. Yeah, I mean, and I also feel like, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I always liked a lot of Dan Slott stories during the Brand New Day era, and, and maybe if, not that we're going to get a quote-unquote brain trust again of webheads, but you know, certainly if there's like crossovers or stuff like that, I, I, I feel like working with someone like Sadarsky will um, kind of keep Dan a little fresher too in terms of his writing. That's that's a that's another theory of mine too. I mean, just kind of 
opened up the tent a little bit and, and, and get a little more, some more ideas into what's going to happen. Because, you know, my understanding is this series, it's the mainstream universe. It's, it's, it's in continuity. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, they're not even really talking about it as a as a B book per se. I mean, this is like it's it's another Spider Man book with you know, so um in Zadarsky has certainly kind of elevated himself to being enough of a name where I think he could sell a comic just and Kubert I mean we're we're I, we keep ignoring Adam Kubert. Yeah, Adam Kubert's a star in his own right. So I mean certainly there's enough main power behind this book to to drive sales all on its own i don't think it's going to be it's like a little forgotten b book i yeah i'm i'm curious i mean amazing is not selling the way i think they want it to and i wonder if uh how these new launched books are going to do i mean clearly there was no heat behind prowler um, but I mean, man, and, and too, man, Zadarsky, talk about a quick rise. His, his Howard, the duck was canceled and now he's manning a big Spider-Man title. I mean, good for him. All right, Dan. So the other thing, this looks like it's going to be a mini series, uh, edge of venom verse. Yay. I don't really know what to say about this. It's like, can we just relaunch venom and be happy with how that works out? Did, like, this is a whole other conversation that we probably don't need to go into right now because the show is going long. But uh, this whole thing of making variant covers that sell well into series seems like a really bizarre like new thing that Marvel is doing from like Gwenpool onward. As much as I'm enjoying Gwenpool, uh, I don't know. Mark, uh, what are your thoughts about all this? Yeah, I mean... I'm I'm just thinking like like you said we were getting Brock back as Venom and now they're going like all the way back to 92 in terms of oversaturating the market with the character so um I don't know not 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 feeling optimistic Dan let Brock exist and be Brock uh right. don't do this all over again yeah, shut up, Brock. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of books, we found out, uh, I guess, in the last solicit that, by its absence, uh, that Silk was canceled. I, I'm, I don't think this was a shock to many people. I think it was on the bubble for quite a while now, and I think the clone conspiracy crossover didn't do anything to really save this title. Your thoughts, Mark? Yeah, although I heard that there is some speculation that she might come back in some form, maybe as part of a team or something like that. I, I mean, like, it seems like Marvel is not going to go quietly into the night with this character. But, I mean, I have never been a huge Silk proponent. I, I always kind of felt like, not that the character was shoved down our throats, but it was like, you know, she was introduced concurrently with, spider gwen and it was spider gwen that was kind of the phenomenon and then it was like they tried to kind of like have silk leech off some of that heat you know like hey look we're gonna have two new female centric spider titles and (laughs) And, that's the thing none of them were allowed to carry that identity as their own thing you know like how much stronger would spider gwen be if she was like i'm the female spider character and sudden i mean as much as i love spider woman and all that stuff you know like these books aren't allowed to kind of uh own that identity which uh, they don't necessarily have to i'm all for more female books and nobody is shouting i'm the male spider character you know but that's kind of what phil Silk felt like was I'm the female Spider-Man, um, but it was outweighed by these two other books that I think were doing it better. Yeah, and and I think just in general, like you know, when the book first came out, it kind of had an identity, and it was a little too twee for me for the most part. But I got what it was about, and and saw where the where the draw was, but then like certainly after the secret wars and the reboot, um, the book really to me struggled to find its voice and, and its footing. And, and then when, you know, we had the negative zone and like game of Thrones, I think that's when the book really jumped the shark officially for me. That's where I totally checked out. I was like, what even is this? 
Yeah. yeah so, agreed. so not a surprise. Um, so in terms of um, crazy things happening and backup stories, it sounds like uh, in that that jumbo size amazing spider-man that we're going to be getting uh in in a few weeks time uh there's a 10 page backup with uh giuseppe comicoli that dan slot was promoting at what was it, emerald city comic con this past weekend is going to quote unquote change everything when was the last time we heard that mark Yesterday. <laughs> uh, can, can can we even believe this stuff anymore? I mean, how many times have we heard this? I mean, not. I mean, maybe it will. Maybe it will change everything. Maybe Norman sees Peter's face again, and we get that back. I don't know, but uh, it's just. I mean, I guess this was just him speaking. Off the cuff. This wasn't like them releasing a solicit that said that, which we've seen more times than I can count. So I don't fault him for hyping his own book. But uh, uh, can we get a story that doesn't change everything and is just a solid superhero adventure? Game changer. <laughs> Mark, what other uh, 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 like false advertising platitudes do you want to shout into the microphone right now this comic will make you so angry <laughs> that old gem if you thought brand new day and one more day made you infuriated wait till you read the tw- 10 page backup story in amazing <laughs> spider-man 25 it's not even the a story that's how much it changes everything Everything counts, Dan. <laughs> what if it's just one of those like goofy Aunt May cartoons that's on like s- several pages? Aunt May babysits Peter Parker, and the world was never the same again. Yes, Aunt May, Herald of Galactus, babysits <laughs> Peter. <laughs> that would change quite a bit. The um, golden well, oldie. Speaking of changes, and I think some people will see this one as a major positive, uh, this new Make Mine Marvel relaunch, lots of relaunches in this segment of the show. Mark, what is this? Because you just sent me this like an hour ago. Yeah, I mean, you know, so apparently this was kind of coming out of Emerald City Comic Con as well that, um, you know, Marvel is going to do one of their big, uh, you know, company-wide initiatives called Make My Marvel. But uh, unlike Marvel Now and Marvel Now Plus and, you know, more Marvel Now, uh, (laughs) this instead of going back to number one, it sounds like, uh, and we're seeing this with Venom, uh, with Venom being renumbered uh, in May, I, I believe, to issue number 150. Because uh, apparently there have been 150 solo issues of Venom over the years, which might be mathematically true. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the uh, the like log of the intern that had to work that one out. Exactly. But the, the point being is, uh, as part of Make My Marvel, the rumor is, I don't think Marvel has formally confirmed this, but that the um, a lot of the titles uh, are going to be returning to legacy numbering, i.e. Spider-Man is going to go from, you know, volume four, number 27 or whatever to like 700 and whatever the issue. Again, we'll see what the math is. Do they count? Su- That's going to be my big question then. Do you count superior? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I have no idea. But I'm sure whatever it is, it'll ha- be happy to coincide with a 50 or a 100th issue. Yeah, yeah. Although, I mean, I know that I think the article I sent you was was talking about how Thor is going to is coming up on his on its 700th issue in the fall. Um, but I don't know how close we would be to 800 if for Amazing Spider-Man, so... Um, I think we're probably closer to 750, right? I mean, there were only 18 or whatever issues of the last series, well, again, Volume 3. Well, again, that's if you don't count Superior. Right, right. But they're going to want to get to 750 if they can. Right, but I'm saying if if you count Superior, we're, we would be past 750. Yeah, but we're not closer to 800 than we are 750. That's true. So I think they're like... I mean, the, it, it, 
it's in their benefit to be conservative about it so that they can sell a big 750 issue. Right. And I'm guessing we're not going to count like Spiral and Learning to Crawl and um I mean, <laughs> after the ultimate Spider-Man number 200, I'm sure they could work out any math they want because that was not the 200th issue of that book. Lies. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun and exciting, and uh, but what do you think is motivating this? Because I have my thoughts on that. Uh, do you have any idea? I, I, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe looking over at the uh, distinguished competition, not that they kind of went to legacy numbering, but isn't – I haven't been reading a lot of the Rebirth books, but isn't kind of the big draw of that is it kind of like re-acknowledges its old history and stuff like that? Isn't that like yeah. the cash that's my thought is that DC like ate Marvel's lunch this past year and Marvel sales are down, uh, you know, like to a place they haven't been in a while. And I think maybe this is a way to kind of like uh, bring back old fans who are kind of exhausted by all of the number one nonsense. Although it, it it's a pretty stunning heel turn for a company that a year ago said we're moving to seasonal stuff and – and that's it. And maybe a season is up and they're done, which it's about as cynical as you could possibly want. Like a year from now, we could be seeing new number ones. Yeah. I mean, we'll see how long this lasts. But, you know, I think you and I would both endorse the idea of, um, you know, stop diluting your content, Marvel. And maybe and, and, and fans will start coming back. Stop having 11 books from like the same office. Uh you know, 11 versions of the same character. <laughs> and I think I, I'm hopeful that Civil War II and Monsters Unleashed is kind of a come to Jesus for them because both of them just tanked hard, you know. Um, but then again, Secret Empire is coming down the pipe. I'm actually excited about it, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we shall see. Well, anyway, why don't we get into our finale part here, Dan? It is that time, Mark. You are absolutely correct. And, of course, you out there, the listener, hi, how's it going? Uh, thanks for listening. You made it to the end. You can find all of our new Amazing Spider Talk and old Superior Spider Talk podcast over at that lovely site that we like to call our home, SuperiorSpiderTalk.com. Or find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube by searching for Amazing Spider Talk. And if you do, please be sure to leave us a review. We love getting those reviews like we read today on the show. Yeah, and be sure to check out our brother podcast, The Ultimate Spin, if you want to keep up with the adventures of Miles Morales and Spider-Gwen Stacy. Uh, Dan... Where where can we find you uh, talking on the uh, internet thingies? Yes, you can find me talking on the interwebs over on uh, Twitter at, at Sup Spider Talk. That's my handle there. Um, you can also check out the comic that I'm making. It's uh, on Facebook at Comic Entropy. Check that out. Uh, I think you're going to dig it if you like anything that I do. Um, Mark, last week you recorded an interview with a special guest. We talked about it last week, but remind people what to keep an eye out for next week in our, our podcast feed. Who'd you talk to? Well, Dan, you didn't let me plug my stuff. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lead into that through this. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, I, I, I talked with uh, comic book writer Sean Kelly McKeever. He is of Mary Jane and Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane fan. And we had a great conversation that you all will hopefully be hearing pretty soon when this drops. Yeah, it was really fun to listen in on. I, I, I couldn't join because I had other work I had to get done, but uh, I can't wait for everybody to hear it. Um, so, Mark... If they wanted to follow you because, I mean, you're doing these awesome interviews and all this other stuff. Mark, I'm very excited about that interview. But if I was really excited about everything else you were doing, which obviously I am, where would I find you on the interwebs? Well, of course, you can find me on Twitter at ChasingASMblog. And you can find me on Superior Spider Talk where I'm talking new comics and talking uh, Eddie Brock and there and Brock again. And, of course, you can pre-order my book, 100 Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. Dan, before the uh, the Internet betrays us completely, what Uncle Ben scenario do you got for me? 
Mark, you and your Uncle Ben went to a bar once and were accosted by several guys. How did that scenario end? Uh, well, you know, well, first, uh, I, it was kind of weird. Uh, Uncle Ben, you know, he, he flipped up his hoodie, uh, and I saw him, like, grab this the bartender, this really sexy bartender, and, like, kiss her really aggressively. Um, and I was like, whoa, Uncle Ben, like, what's going on there? And, like, he took, like, a, a, a pool cue, and he, like, broke it in half and started, like, whacking these people. And then, like, he started to transform into this, like, horrible clone monster. And I was like, oh, my God, my Uncle Ben is Spider-Side. Uh, and, and who designed his costume? It's horrible. It's hideous. Like, what is that? Like, like Mark Bagley, I thought you were great. What is this? <laughs> Uh, seriously. And, and, you know, like I was just like, he's not going to die from these, these guys beating him up. He's going to die from embarrassment on that costume. Right. And uncle Ben was like, Oh my God, I am. And he just dropped dead of embarrassment. And as he was being all shamed, he shouted out with great podcasts must also come amazing spider talk. Peace